Hi. Thanks for coming out so early on a Saturday. Um, so we have a, a pretty good, pretty large panel today. So I don't want to waste time uh, talking. I'm going to just introduce them. And guys backstage, if you hear your name, please come out. Um, so we have the showrunner and director of Queen Sugar, Kat Candler. Um, from Halt and Catch Fire, we have the creator, Christopher Rogers, and we also have one of the stars, Scoot McNary. And as, as Emily said, from Life Unexpected, we have uh, Liz Tigler and Christopher Palaha. And we also have Jonathan Tucker, who has been in a ton of shows, most of which you've seen here, if you've been here multiple times. Parenthood, Kingdom, Westworld. Welcome, everybody. Okay, so I have to just like start with the elephant in the room. Like the, the panel is called flawed characters, but I kind of feel like every character is flawed, right? Like that's, that's the gray that we live in in television. Uh-oh. Oh no. Just, just sit on my lap. <laughs> so um, I would love to actually start with, with those of you who created your shows. Liz, Christopher, can we talk about what goes in, what is your definition when you're creating a quote flawed character? You know, what is your definition? What do they have to be that's you know, not a saint, pretty much anything else? <laughs> I mean, I, it's funny. I, when I think of flawed, ugh. when I think of flawed characters, I I immediately think of the flip side, which is the note you always get, which is like make somebody likable, and I feel like um, it's like the L word, but I feel <laughs> like um, really to me a flawed character is just what makes a character interesting are their weaknesses, um, their vulnerabilities, the things that you know where they. Um, want to do the right thing, but they do it in the wrong way. Or they do the wrong thing, but it was for the right reasons. And so, I, I don't know, I feel, like, I feel like it's figuring out that kind of mathematical equation um, in building a character. Uh, I think you nailed it. I mean, I, I think we relate to characters for their vulnerabilities, not you know, for their, their alpha qualities. I, I think we want to be those people, and yes, there's some wish fulfillment to characters on TV, but we can really kind of put ourselves in them and in inhabit those emotions when they feel like emotions we've experienced. And most of us are pretty flawed ourselves. And uh, so I think those flaws are usually more important because just kind of writing in a strong jawline and you know an ability to kind of cut through the clutter right. is, it does not a real character make. She's hot, even at 40. <laughs> 40 and still almost a woman. <laughs> Well, have you guys gotten notes on characters that have, you know, characters that you didn't necessarily think, speaking of, of that, you know, of the but, but the, you know, the end still. Have you gotten notes that kind of gave you a different perspective on what a flaw was for one of your characters? Well, I mean, I remember doing Life Unexpected. I got... I definitely had like written a draft of the pilot. I mean, I wrote a million drafts of the pilot, but I'd written a draft of the pilot and um, the note I got back about Sherry Appleby's character, Kate, was, it was like, she's so um, angry and she's a woman, but she doesn't seem to want to like get married and have children. And it was like, she's, kind of shrill and anyway I was kind of like what are you talking about of course I'd written myself and I was like she's in, I was like she's endearing and charming and I was like she's so lovable like what are you talking about and then I remember the note was also like um, she just seems to, uh, it was like, it was like she seems to take things out on other people versus more like turning them inward and it was like I'm like, like in, inward in what way? Like cutting? Like what, like what are you talking about? And so it was very, um, I remember feeling very like personally offended. <laughs> it was like, she's lovable. <laughs> which, which is a sign you're doing it right? Because I mean, characters are really a way just to settle your private scores with your wife or loved ones. And that's, I think that is true. Most of the notes that come in are like, would a nice person say this? And it's like, I, this nice person said it this morning. And that's... Yeah, okay. Um, 
so Kat, for Kat and for the actors as well, I mean, Kat coming into showruns, you know, the, the season three after the show had been on for a little while and for actors, like, being drawn to these characters, what are the the vulnerabilities that draws you in personally? Let's let's go down the line. Start with Kat. Yeah, I mean, for us, we have uh, Ralph Angel, who's this formerly incarcerated man, and you know he's coming off of being in prison for four years and all of the sort of constraints that surround that in his everyday life. And there's just this innate like pride to him. There's this innate anger about the situation, but in the driving force of it all. You know, all of these flaws are so beautiful because they're who we are and they're what make us so messy and, 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 and complicated. But at the end of the day, with every character, there's a driving purpose behind that. So for his character, there's this driving purpose of taking care of this little boy. And that he'll do anything for and he'll make every mistake in the book. He'll struggle every which way to take care of that child. And I think that's what's so beautiful about all of our characters is, you know, they're so freaking messy and and you're, they're constantly tripping and struggling and getting up and you're always wanting to be like, don't, oh, don't do that. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we understand in our gut why they're doing that. And we're totally, again, because we've all made those mistakes, but at the heart of it, there's a driving force between before, behind every mistake and decision that they're making, which is, I think, what is so beautiful about, you know, human beings um there's the there's this like interesting acting um theory that i remember reading i was like oh this is really wonderful where there's a you have um a, a public persona like how your how your character is being perceived or wants to be perceived and obviously the crossover between who we are as real human beings is um <clears throat> similar um and there's something that you want right that you really want to get respect from your father or um, <clears throat> respect from your child or whatever it might be. And then you've got this fatal flaw and that fatal flaw is what keeps you from getting what you want. And it can potentially sustain a character's drive over the course of potentially, you know, uh, five years, six years or one's entire life. Um, and I've loved like this idea of fatal flaws and you, and you see them revealed from time to time, particularly like in a pilot episode, I always find like there's these little private moments that one can find whether it's like somebody washing their hands and looking in the mirror or like putting on some clothes or something. And you can just see very small in small ways that there's something that's going to crack here, like in this big dam or that they're trying to plug in this dam. Um, so I'm, I'm always interested in like in finding those in really subtle ways and trying to interpret like the subconscious sort of work that the writers are putting out there because they know that there's like this big flaw and they might kind of tell you, up front, but they could also be saving it or trying to find it themselves, or it could be part of their own experiences, and that it'll reveal itself over the course of um, the arc of the character, whether it's in one season or multiple seasons. But, um, you know, the, what's the nothing's fun just driving like you don't want to drive like a perfect car or like you scoot and I were talking about horses like you want to like you want to be on something that's got a little a little dynamism to it. Like, you know, I, I, I drive a Crown Victoria P71 police interceptor. Like, that thing's got some issues, and it's a, and it's a lot of fun. You know I mean? You want to drive something with some scars, and, and that's what attracts me to people. Um, and every person is flawed, or every person has got a vulnerability. I certainly have got multiple ones, and, um, and every character's got them. And so I'm attracted to characters that are fully realized and dynamic and authentic. That's a beautiful answer. <laughs> I don't want to follow that. <laughs> don't say that. Good, no, good morning, everybody. Um, I think, I think uh, when I was a kid watching TV, and like, say you're watching Happy Days, and you had Richie Cunningham or the Fonz. The Fonz was like this, you know, cool, he was, but he was a leather jacket wearing, he was a different guy, or Felicity. You know, she had these two guys that she was choosing between, and one was perfect, and one was a little broken and a little run down. And I don't know what it is about me, because I think, I think all of us, are, there's a part of all of us that's, you don't have to call it broken, but flawed. And I think that what we do in our day-to-day -day life is try our very, very best to hopefully make those things better and you continue to work towards something. And so I think when you're an actor and you're given a chance to play, like Liz wrote this beautiful character, Bays, for me, or not for me, but I won the part, but she, I wish it was for me. <laughs> I wish I was there in my life at that time, but I'm glad, we, I'm glad it happened anyway. Um, uh, and there were two characters. There was one character, Ryan, who, and ultimately you saw that he too was flawed. Like when, as we were able to go down the story, you saw that this guy who had everything on the front end 
you know, still had his things, but Baze was just such a broke down dude. And what you said so eloquently is like he wanted his father's love and he never earned it. And he was this guy who was all about unfulfilled potential. And I don't know what it is. I think uh, t to me as an actor, there's just something far more compelling and far more interesting to play a guy who's broke down, who's, who, whose potential is unfulfilled than it is just to play, you know, the hero who comes in. And that's why Superman to me was always a little like, eh, I get it, but he's an alien, he's not. <laughs> But Batman was like, dude, this guy's he's he's an orphan, he's scared, he's creepy a little bit, and he's a hero. Like it's that it's that guy. Yeah, he's a bat. Superman got shot from a planet to another planet. I mean he has problems too. <laughs> it's true, he's an orphan too. He's an orphan too. <laughs> right. Batman's been on Earth, or at least. <laughs> All right, I'll concede the point. Um I, I feel like these five people have pretty much nailed it on the head, so I won't elaborate too much on it, but I, th I think all humans are flawed, and I think what we do more so is trying to cover up our flaws. So when I'm usually, I don't necessarily dissect it, I think, the way that the writers do, because they have to get underneath it and then make it look like it's not hitting you over the head with it, but... For me, when I'm reading something, it's the flaws that I think I subconsciously uh, are attracted to. Because I think when in life, when we make these decisions that like, oh, this character should have done this, but for the right reasons, for the wrong, I feel like we've all been in those situations. So therefore, those are highlights of moments in our personal life that when we watch on TV, we sort of subconsciously see it and connect to it, and we don't know why we're connecting to it. We just know that, like, oh, I've been there before. I felt that, like, and oh, I, yeah, I should have told my boss to go f himself. <laughs> and that person did it, and that's, you know, so to me, it's, I think, those moments when we see those, those things happen are the things that, as an actor, I, when I read them, I, I think, oh, I, I've been there before, and here's an opportunity to go tell my boss to f off, you know? <laughs> so, but that's, I won't elaborate too much on it. So, I, th I mean, I, what I love about this panel is the perspective, right? We have writers, we have a director, we have actors. It starts on the page. Some writers will write in very clearly, like, every character detail, every stage direction. Others won't. And actors and directors have a little bit more freedom to find these things. In, so I, can we talk a little bit about your process? Like, how much do you guys write the stuff in, Liz and Chris, or, or how much is it a collaboration? I mean, for me, it's a, you know, even to hear Scoot talk about it, there, there's such a massive feedback loop, which is, uh, I think in success, writers make, I'm sorry, actors make writers look so much better than they deserve to because, you know, I think, I think we sometimes give actors just the, the base of something and then they do something so interesting or, or, or so real and inhabited with it that you're just like, oh, let me write into that. Like, let me keep feeding that. And I certainly know that's what we did with Scoot after we saw the pilot. Um, you know, that character, Gordon Clark, is, is so much a response to the way you portrayed him in the first episode of the show. Um, that, that's just a million times better than the three-line description I'm sure we put into the pilot. So, so I think if you're doing it right, you should really kind of listen to, to what's working and kind of write into it. And that's, that's certainly how I like to approach it. I think that goes both ways, though. I mean, you can get some dialogue, too, that you're just like, you get so excited to do it because it's so well written. You know what I mean? And I think that, you know, yes, you guys give the actors a lot of credit. But without a foundation or a backbone, we, we, we actors have nothing, really. <laughs> no, I'm not, we have nothing. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I remember. What, what it was, I want to say it was episode three, where it was the dinner scene, where where Bays and and uh, and Kate and Lux show up at the at oh, my yeah, dad's yeah, house yeah, yeah. at the dad's mm -hmm. house, and Liz had written this just this beautiful scene about uh, like the disappointment of and it all of it and all of a sudden my character snapped into three dimensionality like all of a sudden. There was this one scene that sort of described the entire arc of who this guy was and this guy's entire heart. And that was all, I mean, that came from the writing. And that was something that, like, I think you had created, you drafted these outlines of who these people were. And obviously you saw the three-dimensionality behind them all. But then for an actor, I was able to walk in one day and go, oh, this is who this guy is. And, and when you had the family dynamic all set into place, it was like watching something spring to life. It's so interesting because, um, you know, when you... 
when you sell a, sh- I mean, I don't know if anyone else, fe- I mean, I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but it's like you sell, you know, you, you have to like go in and sell your pilot. And so you have to put together this pitch and go sell it. And, and you're just thinking like, put together the pitch to sell it. Like, that's all you're thinking of. You're like, craft the pitch so it sells. Yeah, you're gonna have to pitch what the pilot is, but you don't know. So you're just like, make something up that sounds good and doesn't lead to too many questions. You know, anything you don't know, skate over it fast, you know. <laughs> basically act really confident and act like you know what the show is and then sell it and then you'll figure it out after you sell it. So then of course, if you're lucky enough to sell it, then you have to sit down and figure it out. And and it can be, you know, um, I sold something a few years ago that was like, it was based on this beautiful book, um, uh, Karen Russell's book, Swamplandia, which I was like, oh, this is gonna be so epic. And then when I sat down to write it, I was like, "Um, I'm writing a show about alligators. (laughs) Like, I'm gonna be in, Louisiana with Barry Sonnenfeld and alligators. Like, I was like, this is terrible. Anyway, uh, needless to say, it did not get picked up. But the point is that, that then you sit down and in the pilot, you're, you're crafting these characters. I mean, I'm, I'm doing it now. And, and even as you were like, like fatal, I'm like, fatal fall. Right? <laughs> like, yeah, I need to go back and like, really look at that. Like that scene where you're like, oh, I get it. It, it just, it's interesting. Cause you're, this is where actors, I think um, it's, it's, nice because obviously they're, they very gen- generously give writers a lot of credit. And yes, we put a lot of thought into it, but I know for me personally, it's amazing how little you know what you're doing and how much you're finding the show as it goes. Mm-hmm. Like when you sell a pilot and people are like, what's the second episode? You're like, I don't know, I barely got through this one. Like, I mean, I have no idea. Like, I don't know at all. Um, and you're like, I'll figure it out after I shoot them. It's what's so interesting about all these yeah. like straight to series pickups, I have to say, and, and being involved in, in some, it's like without having the freedom to find the pilot, like I didn't know who Bayes was mm-hmm. until Chris Palaha got cast and we sat around in Vancouver and I watched him do his thing. And I was like, it's amazing. I know who Bayes is now. I'm such a genius. No, it's like, I knew it. I knew who he was because I saw him embodied. And then now we start to get to have a dialogue and a feedback. And of course he's now influencing everything we do in the writer's room. And now we're writing to somebody. So it's like, you're discovering it. And I think, um, um, finding that as you go and kind of peeling back those layers. But it just always amazes me, for me, how very little I know the entire time. Um, I'm so glad you said that. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Um, You know, from the director's standpoint, so I, so Queen Sugar, I came in as a director first season and then a producing director second season, a producing director, for those of you guys who don't know that term, is someone who kind of helms all of the directors and makes sure that the continuity of the visual language or is, you know, servicing the story, the protector of the story, and then the showrunner the third season. And I will confess, every step of the way, I had no clue what I was doing. Um, but I figured it out some, I think. Um, but in terms of the process between, you know, the showrunner, the creator, to the director, to the actors, you have, as you're prepping, you have a tone meeting, which is what you're, you have this dialogue, this conversation with the showrunner, the creator, and they're giving you basically all the tools to talk to the actors and really kind of dive into each scene and know the purpose of the scene, the driving force of the scene. And it's interesting, you know, as we've found going from like the first season to, and then diving into further seasons, the dialogue, you know, the actors are so like ingrained and immersed in their characters. And, um, it, you know, sometimes it's a really easy dialogue as a director. Sometimes you just keep your hands off and watch them just shine and like explode on screen in a beautiful way. And um, sometimes they're just, you know, tonally of a scene trying to figure out and maintain that you're keeping the vision of the creator and the showrunner. But I would be curious from you guys. In town ter- meetings? Well, no, I mean, like, in terms of. I have a lot to say about town meetings. <laughs> but in terms of. Like, a separate panel. I mean, you can come on doing the other panel. You should come on that one, too. That's great. Is but there a having, town meeting yes, panel? There's a, there's a tone panel, yes. Oh, really? Absolutely. Oh, wow. Today, yes. I, I think wanna, it's at I like 1.30. I don't know. Tone the whole meeting panel. panel. <laughs> be curious because but you know, yeah, you're right. television it's a great point. Yeah. is you're coming in with like different directors for every episode and you guys having to navigate all of those different directors in terms of you know some are more actor driven some are more visual driven like how are you guys navigating like what you know in your heart versus what you know some directors might be telling you that yeah i'd say that the tone meetings are great and i think that they're very very beneficial for for those reasons the only thing with the tone meeting for me was it felt like a telephone. 
Whereas you guys are sitting down and giving this director all this detailed information that we're not privy to all of it, you know? So all of a sudden the director comes in and they'll, you know, everything's going fine and they'll give you a note that you're like, but wait, what about this? And then they're like, whoa, direct deer in headlights. They're like, oh, I didn't plan on like a rebuttal, <laughs> you know? And, 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 I don't, and I don't have an answer for that. And then we get into this weird spot of like, well, let me just call Chris. And then I'm kind of like, well, why didn't we just sit through the tone meetings and then none of this would have happened? You know what I mean? We're all on the same page. However, that's not how it works. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm aware of that now. But it, for me, I always it was like, well, I wasn't in that meeting. You know what I mean? Like, how am I supposed to know that? You know what I mean? So, um, but coming and working with different directors is, I think you guys do a really good job of getting them up to speed because, you know, I was fortunate on Halt to work with some really incredible filmmakers and, and directors. And so I didn't see much, I, I didn't see that much of that, you know, in regards to a disconnect between I mean, that. I think also like when we talk about, you know, the flaws and the vulnerabilities of these characters, you know, part of it is also like understanding, right? Like the motivations behind it. And I think that kind of speaks to what you're talking about is sometimes you'll get a note where you don't quite understand that motivation. So, I'm curious from your perspective then, um, have there specifics, I want to get, I want to get dirty and nerdy, like, has there been a time where you've gotten a note that you're willing to share the note where you're like, I don't understand where this note is coming from, this is not the motivation I worked out, and then how do you work through it? <laughs> you can start, because you seem like you've got a lot to Let's say, air it out, guys. And I do want to say, I do just want to say one thing, you, like, we're, we can be us, any show, you can talk about any show. This show is a learning curve. No, talk about yourselves. <laughs> but I had a story, there was a story that I was supposed to be reading my daughter one night, um, about the, ja the the Jack and the Beanstalk, and you know, you know and it was a metaphor for, for him. Di he digs this hole in his backyard, and he's going nuts. But he's talking. He's really talking about Joe McMillan. But he's talking about. The, and the and the, the director wanted me to read this bedtime story to my child with rage. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So you know, we did a take, and it was like he's like, no. I mean, you you hate to Joe McMillan. I'm like, I get it, but I'm reading to my kids. <laughs> You know, he's like, no, but it, and I just, I'm sure he had a point, and, I, and I'm sure that I was confused. That part was clear. <laughs> but there was that disconnect where I was like, I wanted to do what he wanted, but it didn't make any sense in my head. That uh, To me, Gordon Clark was a very much a father and very much would, I just didn't see him acting this way in front of his kids. You know what I mean? And so there was... And I don't remember where we ended in the end, you know, with it. I think I tried it and we tried both things and we, we met somewhere in the middle in the end. But I just remember specifically to that was like leaving work that day, just being like, should I be reading to my kids more violently? <laughs> or do other parents read to their kids like this, you know? And then thinking, maybe I'm not a great father. I need to be. I think, I think the guest director yeah. program in general is a broken, I think it's one of the great flawed systems in television. Okay. Um, when what you're, you repeat, you say? guest directors, yeah. um, there are really great guest directors. I mean, like, absolutely magnificent. Mm -hmm. And the, the, but there's quite a few that are not. And sure. quite a few that are well, frankly directing traffic. Yeah, and it's hard when they don't know the show. They're being asked to come and in that you know the show better than course, they do. Of course, but it, it, and if you also are talking about diversity in behind the camera, which is a really important issue, you know, you ha it's, there's all these older white guys who have been doing it for 25, 30 years. They've got hundreds of episodes of television and they're really good at directing traffic. Mm -hmm. um, and and, the, and there, there's not a mentorship sort of program that is critical for people of color and for women to get behind the camera um, because there's it's such a big like practical event it's just practical like we need to get x amount of setups done we need to get this co this scene covered you need to have somebody who has enough like facility with language to explain like how the camera and lighting and everything else works but I frankly find it really frustrating to come in because I've put in so and I, I info dump on these directors like I'll start a text thread and like just start just regurgitating as much information as I possibly can. Um, and when it gets sticky and it's got, because a lot of guest directors want these scenes for their reel. So like, they're going to be like, bigger, faster. It's like, man, this is just like, I'm just going to the gas station here. Like, <laughs> I, you know, I'm just like, this is, let's just have a breather here for this scene. And I'm really interested in, in this like, 
I, I, I don't, uh, I guess I'm using these esoteric terms, but I just read, was listening to this great podcast with, I think it was Paul Schrader. I think it was Schrader who was talking about like this transcendental directing and acting. And it's like, how do you give space and make the audience lean forward to fill the space? Either they're going to get they're either they're going to do this and change the channel or they're going to walk out of the theater or they're going to lean in and be like, what is this person trying to do? What are they trying to tell? And I'm really interested in that, but it also is, you have to have a lot of courage and faith in the work that you've done. Otherwise, you're stepping back so far, people are like, boy, this is boring, and they leave. Um, a lot of guest directors are uncomfortable with that. They're crazy uncomfortable with that because they feel like it's not popping, it's not moving. And um, if you're trying to tell a really great story and you're really trying to interpret what the writers are saying, um, that gets sticky. Well, especially in television because you're moving so quickly. Right, you're telling a story so quickly. I remember specifically with so when I, I got my start on a TV show called North Shore, and it was flying Woo! past me so fast. <laughs> North Shore, <laughs> and it was. Ha <laughs> we all remember that failed show, um, <laughs> and it was moving so fast. And these directors would come in, and it was exactly right. And I was a young kid. I didn't know how to like stand up for myself as an artist. I didn't know how to talk to directors. I didn't know how to, I didn't know the writers. The writer room was in LA. We were in Hawaii. There was zero connection between the two. Um, the guy who created the show ended up just being a, a sort of a uh, right, like in the writer's room. He had no real say in like where the direction was because it was a different showrunner. And the thing just, it was like it, every week was this different product that no one had a say in. No one had an artistic say in. And then the next show, I got a little more confident because all of a sudden, and then truly it was Liz's show when all of a sudden it was Gary Fleeter, it was Liz and the cast, and we would sit down and talk. And the entire pilot episode was spent in Vancouver. Just, we had four days of rehearsal and we would just sit and we would read the script and then we would talk. And then Gary would be like, you, you want to read the script again? And we'd start reading the script again. And then all of a sudden we'd come back the next day. And it just was this beautiful unfolding. And we had some guest directors that were a total waste of time. And they came in and we knew the characters and who I connected to, like the people that anchored me to the show were Liz, Gary. And then all of a sudden, every once in a while you'd get a director. And then when those directors came in, they, they eventually would come back. Like Jerry Levine was somebody who ended up being a, a wonderful guest director um, and, and it changes the way that you function because you can actually listen to somebody and you can, you can take their advice. Like if they're giving it's you confidence. notes, it's confidence, it's trust. And it's funny because I think as you, like we can probably attest to this, you can walk onto a set and in the first like five minutes know that if you can trust a director or not. And if you have my trust, I'll go anywhere for you. I'll do anything for you. But if you don't, it's boxing gloves. I'll be like, what the fuck do you want me to do? Why do you want me to do that? Who are you? And it's this weird thing. And, and it's such a, and I don't know if you feel this way too, but it's like hair and makeup. I walk into a trailer and I'm either immediately, I'm trusting them or I'm like, no, nope, no, nope, forget it. This I, is, I'm do my own thing. <laughs> because, you know, they think that they could be the best hair and makeup team in the entire world. They could have the most experience. They could be absolutely trust. I'm not going, maybe I guess I could go and look at their resumes, but the resumes aren't reflective really because who knows what they're actually doing in the trailer. But they're like, I'm the best. And I'm like, I don't know if you're the best. And I'm, about to, that. Yeah. I'm about to go out there. And I'm like, but to my face, no one's going to be like, it was bad hair and makeup team. And they're like, that guy looks terrible. And they're like, let me cut your hair. And, and you're it's like, four in the morning and you're like a guest star on a show. And you're like, I got to protect myself. I and walk all of a sudden in it's contentious. Just looking like <laughs> and say, hey, good luck. <laughs> Try and prove the others wrong. I like that this has turned into like the flaws, uh, like the physical Our flaws, flaws <laughs> like not just the characters. Um, no, but, it, but, but if you're going to bring it back to yeah, directors no. and flaws and everything else, right? Like if you're going to go in there, hair and makeup, it might be like a facial hair thing. And they're like, you're shaving, right? Have we talked to somebody about this? And you've done a lot of work to prepare this character, but it goes back with the guest directors too. If you're trying to present or hide a flaw, <laughs> If you're trying to hide a flaw and it's subtle, yeah, no, yeah. like these directors don't, they, they, they have a hard time understanding that. Yeah. Kat, it, how do you wrangle all this as a director? Yeah, you know what she's dealing with. <laughs> well, <laughs> counter, um, we, I mean, as far as our show goes, we have hired all, I think probably 90% of our directors have never directed television before, and it's an entire female roster of filmmakers. <laughs> Um, so we have uh, 25 directors how, that have come through season one through season three who are now out directing American Crime or 13 Reasons Why or like, you know.
best shows and who are crushing it. And I mean, hats off to Ava, our creator, who basically said, it. I'm just going to hire people I love and, you know, visions and sensibilities that I respect. And um, she's done it from the beginning. And I think we probably are kind of what you were saying. I, when I came back to season two as a producing director, again, not quite knowing what I was doing, but also knowing what I didn't know the first season, like coming in as brand new. Um, I was like, okay, I wish I had known this. I wish I had known this. I wish I had known this. So I essentially created an orientation packet for new directors. <laughs> like, what is a tone meeting? What is, you know, what do you do on a tech scout? And basically created this whole kind of packet of every little basic detail that a director needs to know coming in. And then also the big thing for us is, you know, our cinematography, there's such a, a language to our show. And I mean, all of you guys, like... Halt and Catch Fire um, is like <laughs> the visual language is stunning. But we created like a lookbook of like this is what our show is visually and really as a producing director, we're back there making sure there's a consistency to the look. And if you know something strays, we're like kind of inching back. We're also the the liaison between the directors and the actors as well, making sure there isn't any like kind of snafus between um, that dialogue. But uh, yeah, I mean, you guys are the glue between the crew. Absolutely. I mean, you, yeah. You We're in the thick of it. Right, right. Show running, I would say, is the hardest job in the entertainment industry, period. I mean, it's what I've heard from showrunners, too. And based on. on, on well. well, one of them said it's the hardest job in the world. And then they're like, wait, it's the hardest job in show business. Well, you know, real quick, I, I think. Uh, there is no one right way to do it uh, with TV, but I, I would say, perhaps in defense of, of bringing directors or, or switching things up, if what we wrote is what makes it to the screen, I think we didn't try hard enough. Um, I, I think there's an option at every stage, which is you know when the actors get it, when the director gets it, when, when you get in the edit room to, to quote unquote beat the page to make it better. And sometimes I think it's nice to kind of bring in a new energy and, and see if that fresh set of eyes can change something. I, I'm thinking of um, Reed Murano, who, who won the Emmy last year, did her first episode on Halt. And she just came in with something that wasn't necessarily Halt's visual style, but it was great and it was working. And, and I think we tried to listen to it and it, it gave us a great episode. So I really enjoy that process of, of kind of if the actors are having trouble with it, we need to adjust that. If the director is having trouble kind of finding a way in, we need to adjust that. And, and usually that will kind of, I don't know, give it an added dimension that, that's a lot better than your first draft of it. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, again, I can totally see it, too, because there are some directors that come in and you go, ah, this was a miss. But sometimes I, I think adding a foreign element to the mixture at that moment can give you magic. And, and I think that's sometimes why it's worth taking the swing. So I think we're, I mean, we're at a, a weird time in, in the industry, I think, because on one hand, you have the ability to evolve characters and evolve environments of shows because you do have some networks, streaming, cable, wherever they may land, um, that gives time, that allows you, that picks up a show for two seasons and gives you that chat time. Then on the flip side, you have shows that are canceled very abruptly after one season where you might not have the chance to evolve. How do you guys adjust for that? Like, do you go in and say, when you're pitching a show, do you go in and say, I'm going to dial back on some of what I would consider a flaw of this world or of this character because I want to ease them in? Or do you say, there may not be time to ease them in, we have to go big? Mm. <laughs> I mean, Next I mean, question. I, I, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're going to sell a show, I, I would love to hear what well, you would tell. I, I would just say, is it as, as a rule for me, at least, I, I just think that's death to hold anything back. I, like, like, I think if the audience has any inkling it's coming or if you think it's your best move, you got to make it now and then trust that you'll be able to find another best move. Um, I, you can't let that out stuff, uh, that outside stuff in to, to the process. I think you just have to kind of believe that this is going to have a chance if you've been given a chance and, and try to proceed from that place uh, or at least... I'm not talented enough to do it any other way. And don't you and don't you find though that you've ingrained the themes of this show like in the pilot? Like when you've written a pilot, haven't you based you've like put the flaw like isn't aren't you the should, flaws but like not everybody, I feel instituted less. in that original thing? So then you're it's sort of streaming out throughout, kind of. Ideally, I mean, yeah, I think ideally, um, 
I also think, I don't know, it's kind of like the, a little bit of like the Greg Berlanti school of, uh, of television, but I remember being in a room and being like, oh, that's the, that's like the finale of the first season. And he's like, or it's act two of your pilot. And you're like, oh, okay. Like, it's like, move it all up. Don't save it. Like, just kind of uh, go for it. Like, don't wait. Cause you might not get an opportunity basically. And you guys have all had vast careers on broadcast, cable, streaming. Where do you feel you've had the most freedom on a specific show? Do you feel like where the show lives really is making a difference for the type of character you can be at this stage? I would say um, I did casual on Hulu for three seasons. And um, that show, oh, thanks. Um, um, uh, casual. Um, and, we had so much, I mean, we had a tremendous amount of freedom with that show. Uh, I mean, Hulu, I always call them like the red cup party. They're like, hey, they're like, it's $5 for a cup. And we're like, we're making shows and we're partying. And it's like, you know, they're so fun um, and very, very good. Um, and they give great notes, but they're, they're very supportive. And we, um, I don't know, we did a lot of episodes that were very kind of outside of the box, um, you know, episodes that were just like all took place in a night in Burbank or episodes that went back in time but or just, just we had a lot of kind of room to navigate with them um and that was a lot of freedom there's also the freedom of not really handing in outlines and um just kind of there maybe it was a combination of like the show kind of working first season and maybe the confidence in the group. Um, and we were also able to bring in a lot of, uh, we had mostly female directors and it was a lot of indie filmmakers, Lynn Shelton and Mari Heller. And so it was kind of its own, um, uh, kind of it. And they kept coming back. So the show really kind of had that voice, um, their specific voice very infused into it. But I would say like, that's probably the place. I mean, I'm a, I do almost everything at Hulu now because I feel like that's just a, a place where you have a lot of creative freedom and you have the time to really start the room, write the episodes, and then go shoot instead of the scramble of broadcast. Um, because I, I actually, it's not being allowed to say f or like how people have sex or all the things that are like what makes cable cable or streaming streaming and network network to me it's the time to actually have a writer's room and break the stories that is the biggest difference. In, in network, you get six weeks before, you know, you get your pickup at Upfronts, and by July, you're shooting. And you basically, in six weeks, you have the pilot, yes, but you have to figure out what the show is. And remember, you don't know what the show is because you just sold it and you have no idea. So it's like you only have six weeks to find it, and then, you know, things can go wrong and get thrown out and suddenly you're in a hole and then you're just like writing pages the night before shooting and you know, you're like, I don't know, on revenge and nothing makes sense. And you're like, is that initiative bad or good? I can't remember. Does she love that guy or that guy? I don't know. <laughs> but also in terms of likability. flawed characters to a flawed system. I know. <laughs> but it is. I mean, and I think that's yeah. what's beautiful is like. The it, whole thing. Wait a minute. It is a we thought. gotta fix it. <laughs> Fault. We're striving. <laughs> but also in terms of like, the, we, you talked about at the beginning of the panel, like the likability of a character, right? When you're writing them, when you're playing them, when you're directing them, you know, how do you feel that you're allowed, or if you feel that you're allowed to have a character that you don't necessarily have to root for? Do you feel like you can be flawed and people will still want to watch you? Do you feel like that's only true on some of these platforms. I have an interesting answer for that. We, I was a part of a show called Backstrom and Rain Wilson played this character and one of the notes that kept coming back because he was supposed to be an he was supposed to be super unlikable. And Rain, who I think is a genius and I think exactly did the right thing and, and what was fascinating about watching Rain Wilson play Backstrom was it was coming right off the heels of him sort of wrapping up Dwight and what doing the pilot with him was an act of murder. Like he was literally killing Dwight as he was creating <laughs> Backstrom. And it was fascinating. But the notes that came back were like, he's just not likable. He's just not right. like, he's like, he's too unlikable. And we got canceled. I mean, it was one and of those things where- And that was a Fox where, show. It was Fox. So, I yeah. mean, maybe in, on like Netflix, it wouldn't have mattered if he was Well, right. Likeable. And I wonder if they had, the, if Hart Hansen had the time to, uh, to unwrap that in a different way or if Cable to really go to a place to, to be able to say, you know, naughty words or do naughty things and be able to show that versus keeping it all hemmed in for now. I don't know, but it, it was, it, it, it sort of ran, it ran a grand a little bit, sadly. I also think it's like those flaws. And I mean, you know, 
it's what's fun about doing most shows. It, it made casual specifically fun because we had a very small room. They were very flawed characters that were like outwardly flawed and kind of twisted and, um, but they were so human and like so many of the stories, you know, even when we started on, when we hired people in season two and three, um, Xander Lehman, who created the show, would say in the interviews, like, are you comfortable sharing like your personal basically. And it was like, we don't want to come in here and hear how your life's great and like your marriage is great and like everything's great. We want to hear like what's up. Like, and if you, like, you got to like dig deep. And um, I think that that's, to me, that's why the show was so specifically, that, that was what was so fun about writing it. And, you know, I think I've told the story before, but we were we were one time struggling to kind of come up with an episode. And it was kind of in that first season when the show is still finding itself. And I had just had this experience in the, like a couple days before where um, I think it was before my wife and I were married, but we had gotten into an argument. Um, she loves it when I do this, tell the story in public. Um, and uh, we'd gotten into an argument and I don't know why, but she went to take out the trash because she's a very nice person who takes out the trash every day. And I was so mad at her that when she did it, I just locked the door of the house. And once you've locked somebody out of their home, the only thing worse than doing that is now knowing you have to unlock the door and let them back. Like, it was like, it was all bad. It was like, I locked the door and then I was like, oh my God, why did I do that? And then all of a sudden I hear from outside, lock the door. <laughs> and, then I'm like, and then I'm like, I didn't lock the door. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh no, now I can't unlock the door because now she's going to come in. And also when she tells the story, I'm going to be the person who locked her out of the house like a criminal. And so anyway, um, we were sitting in the room and we were like trying to think, and I was like, I did lock my wife out of the house the other day. I don't know if there's anything that we could do with it. I don't know. And so we're just talking about it. And the next thing you know, I'm writing an episode where Michaela Watkins locks her husband in the garage and uh, won't let him out for a much longer period of time than I kept her outside. But to me, what I loved, I was just like, yes, I'm a bad person who did a bad thing. I locked somebody out of their own home. But like, if you'd been in on this fight, you would have understood why <laughs> I was right. <laughs> and, and it's like, yes, that's extremely flawed, but it's so much fun to me. And um, I think that I think that that's the fun of it. You want to see these characters. You, they're hum th these are human things that people do. We're all doing this stuff all the time. We're just not talking about it because we're embarrassed because it's embarrassing. So <laughs> that's the fun to me of, of writing. It's like you get to unearth these flaws. You get to admit what you did. I mean, and in a writer's room, I mean, we'll talk about this later in a writer's room panel, but like, you know, you know things about the people in that room that their spouses don't know. I mean, you're like, you get together for like a holiday party with people's spouses and you're like, don't bring up Vegas, don't bring up Vegas. <laughs> like, you know, you're just like, and you're like, stop, don't bring it up. <laughs> you know, you know everything. <laughs> so I would love to take some questions from the audience if anybody has any, yes. I see you first and then I'll come to you in the, Yes, if you can stand uh, this up. This is just for Kat real quick. Um, you said you put together a document for like uh, new directors. Is there any way you could release that? <laughs> <laughs> you gonna ask, the I was going to ask the same question, Kat. <laughs> That's a good yeah, idea. I, I think so. I mean, it, it certainly is catered to our show a little bit, but I think, yeah, I don't see I'm looking great, at you, great. Kristen. <laughs> can I? OK, yeah, I think, yeah, I would love to. Um, so the question about being likable versus, I think, being watchable. Like, for me, I know likable people in my life. I don't need to watch them on television. Why does it seem like that's treated as mutually exclusive? That, you know, a character can be unlikable and you still want to root for them. You still even care what happens to them. You want to see what happens next. You come back next week or the next day or whatever. So why is that treated like it's mutually exclusive? Can I, can I, uh, this is something that's, you know, I've looked into time and time again because I love totally unredeemable characters that are just awful people. Why do I like them? And why do other, why do, not just me, why do other people like them? So I looked and looked and my best sort of like framework scenario is Daniel Day-Lewis and There Will Be Blood. There's not one redeeming quality of the person. Why do we like him? And my only justification was from the moment we see him, we see his determination to get this thing out of the ground. So much that he's out there by himself. He's sleeping out there. He's by himself. He blows up the thing. He finally gets the rock. He pushes himself with a broken leg. Right from the get-go, you're like, God, this person is so determined. I feel like you fall in love with that. 
And afterwards, he could be the most awful person in the world, and you're still, but he's determined. So I don't know if it's always determination or some little thing that you can give your audience in the beginning for an unlikable character, that there's nothing they can do after that that you're like, and it's something in the subconscious of like, oh, I wish I had the determination like that. Like, now, now this character is fascinating to me because I want to be determined. So I don't know what it is that the writers do, but they hook, they put that hook in there. I couldn't, I'm not a writer, I couldn't do it, but they put that hook in there that, because I find myself constantly asking, why do I love these awful people? You know what I mean? And, and it was a question that always comes up, and, I, and for every character I have to find, why do I like this one? Oh, because he does this. And I'm not right, I'm just coming up with my own, like, well, that's what must be why I like them. That could be a wrong answer, but. It, it's, it's also interesting, I mean, one thing we haven't talked about, but your question kind of speaks to it is, um, how much more leniency we give male characters to be unlikable than female characters. And what, you know, it's, I mean, it's like a constant struggle to, I mean. But that, and that's life too, weirdly, isn't well, it? Well, yeah, like I mean, when it's you get a, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's and, that weird double standard. Yeah, Sorry. completely. No, that's it. And I mean, that was why, you know, um, I mean, even on, on Life Unexpected, I felt like, Chris's care, I mean, it's kind of like the difference between a mom and a dad. Like, like, you know, a dad can do his daughter's hair in braids that look horrible and she kind of looks like, you know, not quite right. And it's like, look at him, he tried. Whereas if a mother sent her child to school like that, it would be like, we need to take that child away. <laughs> um, and it's just, it's a different, it's a different standard. And it, it was interesting because we, you know, both of the, you know, um, both Chris and Shiri played these flawed parents. And I think, um, you know, and they both obviously have like different qualities as actors, but I think that, I think that Bayes uh, got a lot more leeway and was much more beloved for his flaws because we love that in men um, in some ways, you know? And I think women just, I don't know, we get hit harder. Um, we, we actually really saw that on Halt and Catch Fire, where um, in the fourth season, we started to write Donna Clark, who is Carrie Bechet's character, a fraction uh, of Joe McMillan, which was Lee Pace's character. You know, we, we kind of gave her this business ambition. This, I won't even call it ruthlessness, but, you know, the feedback was like, oh, she's the villain now. Mm -hmm. And it was like, no, she's just, she's just, you know, doing what all the other characters do in an open way. Uh, but there is a really interesting double standard there. And, and I would also just say more globally to your question, too. Um, I think it's really important that you take your draft or your characters and write from the villain's point of view as if they're a complete person. You know, that, that they're not just getting up in the morning to, like, twist mustaches and, and sow chaos. Right. Um, why are they doing it? You know, I mean, like, if, if you give them a legitimate point of view, we talk a lot about giving the villain their best argument. Um, then you've got a show that's about competing points of view versus good guys and bad guys. And I, I think that gray area, you know, where anyone can be on the right side or the wrong side usually produces more kind of exciting and different outcomes than, than having a clearly delineated, you know, flawed character versus a hero character. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, have any of you used one of your, something from your own life that you would consider a flaw or a quirk of yourself directly in a character that you want to admit to right now? <laughs> I'm like, I was about uh, to say absolutely, and yeah. then I was like, oh. <laughs> well, I just into went, a character so, that, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I'm, my dad and I have an amazing relationship, and I love him. But I remember when I was playing Bays, it, there was a lot of what he worked a lot when I was a little kid, and it was one of those things where I felt like I had to earn. I felt like I had to do a dog and pony show to like to to break through. And I remember doing an art. I remember being interviewed for during Life Unexpected, and I kind of voiced it in the press. And when I read about it, I was like, "Not nah, That's not it at all." So I'm gonna preload this what I'm about to say with the fact that my dad and I have an amazing relationship and he loves me very very much and he's very very proud of me however there were a lot of things in the Bays and dad relationship that I was able to take from my own life and be like <sighs> and, and and was awesome it was very you know cathartic as an actor to be able to, as a human to be able to go through that and 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 kind of do that so yeah I, uh, I use that yeah and I would say even more even more than just specific characters because of course I think um you know there'll be a kernel of something in a character that you relate to obviously deeply. And I think thematically, like I know, like I'm drawn to shows that, that thematically deal with things that I'm 
interested in, you know, kind of relationships that don't have a place in the world or, or being part of families you don't really belong to or, you know, warming your way in or whatever, like, fucked up thing I like to do. But, um, and, um, and I think there's something so satisfying about that and, and cathartic and, and awesome and getting to explore it. But um, anyway, I can, I, can, I can remember how moving that was and I can remember um, you doing those scenes and how it felt. Yeah, I would say in my marriage, for sure. Like, speci- like so this season, there's a storyline in our show that is very reflective of my marriage and the struggles that come with having success and having a busier schedule and, like, how are you navigating with your partner um, through that and all of the, the messiness and the, just the heartache that goes along with it. And it's... <laughs> It's been a little healing and therapeutic being in that that writer's room and also just the reflection of other people's experiences. But um, yeah, you are so raw. Like it was my first time in a writer's room this season and it's amazing how raw and open and honest the writers have to be to bring the truth to the screen that connects to an audience. And it's truly just like the, as the specificity of that rawness is truly what, you know, regardless of, their, I, I don't believe in villains, I believe in humans who, you know, make mistakes or have a weird driving force, but um, it's really, honestly, that specificity of, of detail and, and building a character that I think draws us all in and makes us lean forward. And I think you can make anyone a hero. I was, I, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. I, like, like, everybody has their own heroic journey. I'm obsessed with Tanya Harding. Um, <laughs> like, beyond obsessed. And may have, whatever, anyway, it's hard to know happening. But anyway, wrote a little thing about her, not I, Tanya, different thing. But anyway, um, but got, basically last year I got to think about Tanya Harding for like six months straight and think about why Tanya Harding was a hero. And, um, she was, and and it doesn't mean she didn't do a you know a bad thing. Um, <laughs> was it the knee really? It was like below the knee. But, um, wow! <laughs> no, no, I'm getting, I'm getting. She didn't do a bad thing, but but it was understanding why she did it, and and being raised in a culture of violence, and how like violence begets violence, and and if that's all you know, that's that's all you know to do. And I think you can make anybody heroic and sympathetic. And that's what's so beautiful. If you lean into their flaws and you understand where their flaws come from and why, um, um, how they got built and what those flaws are also protecting, um, you get to peel that back and you can fall in love with any person. You can, you can, you can love them and like, like, um, almost like whittle them down to their little like sweetest essence, um, and feel so protective of them. I think that the, a good archetype for that is uh, that Charlize Theron mon- monsters, yeah, monster, monster, and uh, she was awful. But throughout the movie, by the, around the, the, the turn of the second act and the third act, you started understanding, ex- and it, you, it justified it for me, the viewer, of like, okay, I get it; it's wrong to kill these people, but I totally understand why yeah. she, how she's justified it in her own head, and it makes obviously makes sense to her because it's making sense to me right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's what's beautiful about this medium. I mean, like, we're all in a room right now because we love, we're either a part of television or we love watching television. It's the human experience. And every time we turn on, we want to be entertained and we want to, like, disappear into something, but we want to watch the human story unfold. And in doing so, we recognize the fact that we're not alone because I think all of us, like, in our own you know, dark little minds, you could go to these places where you're like, what the heck is going on in here? And then all of a sudden you see it externalized, you're like, oh, this is a part of being a human being. This is a part of the human experience. And I think the difference between watchable likability or watchable unlikability goes to there are things that are taboo and there are things that we just don't want to see each other doing. And so we don't show that on television because there's just things that we don't want to see. My, again, I'll go back to my daddy. He, he was a, a, a defense attorney, and he had to see things that he could not unsee. And he's like, there are just things in the world that you don't want to see. But what we have the opportunity to do is take that other side of the face, of the other face of humanity, where it's like, we all kind of, we've all lied, or we've all, we've all done things where you're like, ah, I wish I hadn't done that, but there's a redeemable quality to it. And if we don't truthfully explore those things and show how to redeem those things, then 
then we're just, it, then it's just masturbation. Then it's just like, hey, look at us. We're telling a funny story. Look at that. But it's like, but if you dig deep and you show these flaws and you show what, what it means to be human, I think, and that's what's extraordinary about your show and your show, like when you tell stories from a really human and humans are flawed, like it goes back, we're just, we're broke down and we're all in need of redemption. So it's this interesting, you know, when you can tell that story beautifully and truthfully and honestly, then it's a, then it's a, then it's an amazing thing. And it's why we're all, it's why we love film and television because it's for the first time in humanity, we're seeing the whole thing in technicolor. Yeah. And the universal aspect of it. Um, I watched uh, some kind of monster, this doc about Metallica. And uh, there's this one moment where Lars Ulrich is in uh, the room listening to this new record that they're making and his dad is there and He's just asking his dad, like, you know, what did you think? And his dad won't give him the satisfaction of like liking the record and how the biggest superstar in the world has that moment of just such vulnerability. And it, that I, I go back to that moment in, the, in that documentary constantly because it was so, and you were talking about those little tiny like in-between moments of seeing a human being at just, again, they're like, so naked and so bare and that was just like a moment that just struck me and has stuck with me for however many years that doc came out and those are always the moments I think that we're trying to find as storytellers as artists um, that transcend but yet are so freaking universal regarding you know regardless of of where we live and you know how we've been and raised or whatnot there's just something so connected to all of us in in that. Well, I think that's a perfect way to end it. So I want to say thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you all for coming.